times when he did slip and fall. Uh, you might automatically think of Bathsheba and the fact that he took another man's wife and had that man killed. David also, if you study his life, you'll realize he wasn't a very good father. His children turned out not to follow God. So though he was a good man, he was a godly man, he did make mistakes. But he really kind of helps relate to our life. And as we think about him tonight, we're going to think in the aspect of walking with God. Walking with God. There's a difference between, between knowing about God and actually knowing God. Do you understand that? Knowing about God is a head knowledge. You might know facts about him, that he's omnipotent and that he's a creator, and you may know many, many facts about God in your head. But to actually know God, there has to come a point where your head and your heart line up. Do you, are you with me? Yes or no? Okay. So to actually know him, not just to know about him, to actually know him is a very stronger step. Now, how many of you are married right now? You're married. Okay, all right, good bit. How many of you wish you were? No, I'm just kidding, don't do that. Uh, okay, there's one hand already going up. I didn't even finish it, but there's one hand. Well, there, there's a difference. You know, when, when, you, uh, when you get to know that person that, that you're married to now, you go on a date, right? You inquire with your friends, well, what kind of person are they, and what do they do, and, how, and how do they, what do they like, and, and you're trying to figure them out, okay? Are you with me? Shake your head yes, please. All right, good. So you're, you're getting to know them. You're getting to know about them, but you don't know them, right? But all of a sudden now you get married, and there's a whole different thing to knowing this person. You know where they squeeze, squeeze the toothpaste. That was the, one of the first discussions my wife and I had as a young married couple. Did anybody else have that discussion with your wife? Okay, a few of you. I appreciate those hands. I was one of those guys, you, you squeeze it from the bottom, you roll it up, you squeeze it again. You're, and some of you are shaking your head because that's the kind of person you are. My wife was not that kind of person. You take the cap off, whoop, squeeze that baby, whoop, you whoop, get going. And so I would go in, I'd say, now, honey, you know, you squeeze the toothpaste from the bottom. And she'd go, okay, yeah, all right. Real loving, kind, sweet. And so for a week or two, she would do that. But then all of a sudden, I'd walk back in. Whoop, there it is, laying on the sink. Ha! Ah. So I'd go back, honey, now listen, you got, come here, let me show you. And she's, oh, she was so sweet and wonderful. Oh, yes, honey. And for another couple of weeks. Then all of a sudden, there it is again. And I, honey, come here. <laughs> well, see, we, we knew about each other, but now we're getting, you know what I'm talking about? We're getting to know one another. Now, you know what brought us to that point, though? Is we, we were in love with one another. And in being in love with one another, we made vows and commitments to one another. And see, there's a lot of people who, who know about God. They're even maybe inter interested in God. They they're, they're, they're have this concept about, well, you know, he's, a, he's good, and, you know, he's up there in a rocking chair, and, you know, if you're bad, he throws lightning bolts at you. And Okay, that's, no. They know about him, but they don't know him. They haven't actually made the commitment. They haven't, if you will, they haven't made the commitment to be his, and for him to be theirs. Knowing about God reminds me of Titus chapter 1, verse 16. Now hold your place there in Psalms because we're coming. But let me read the verse to you. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient unto every Good work, reprobate. You and I both know people who talk about knowing God, and yet their life does not reflect their words. 
And we, we wonder why in the world that would, they, we, would they even say they know God when they act this way and they talk this way and they think this way and they live that way. Again, there's much more to really actually knowing God than just knowing about God. I'm reminded of 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. Verse 13, actually knowing God. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may K-N-O-W, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. See, that's, there's, there's a belief in the prospect, if you will, of actually knowing God. There's a belief. It's, it's not just, okay, I know about him up here, but there's a belief, a trust, a dependence, a reliance on. John chapter 5, 1 John 5, 20 says this, And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. See, somebody that has God, knows God, loves God, walks with God, actually knows him, and then there are those people who know about him. Well, as we, as we get into this thought, this message tonight, we're talking about walking with God, and we're going to look at David's life, and we're going to see the steps that he took in order to walk with his God. What did it look like for him? Now, I, I know in your mind you're already thinking, well, you know, David messed up. And may I say that every person's that is seated in this room, this person standing here before you, even as a Christian, you know what? We have, here it is, we have messed, help, help me, we've messed up. Thank you. We all have. Does it mean God loves us less? No. Does it mean that he doesn't want us to walk with him? No, it does not mean that. He wants us to walk with him. He wants us to lean on him. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to give him glory. And as David, as this unfolds, you're going to see this happening in David's life. He had many admirable traits, and his relationship with God is one of those. He had a personal walk with God. He had a yearning to know God. He had a yearning to serve God. He had a yearning to be a part of whatever God was doing. David's relationship with God was a firm foundation for this. Now listen, it was a firm foundation for all that he was and all that he did. It, it challenged him, it directed him, it guided him, it led him in being the person that he became and that he was, and it also led him to do those things for God. As he leaned on God, as he looked to God for direction, Christians... We need that in our lives. I need that. You need that. We constantly need to be recalibrating our hearts to make sure they're pointing toward God and not toward the things of this world. Constantly looking. What's going on in my heart? How am I walking? Am I walking with God or am I walking apart from God? Am I living for him? Have I got the joy of the Lord in my heart, in my soul? Or am I just struggling to get through, trudging? What's going on? In Acts chapter 13, verse 22, Paul reflects on David being a man after God's own heart. You've heard it. Let me read it to you, though. And when he removed him, he raised up them, <coughs> raised up to them David to be their king, to whom they had given testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, to be a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Again, if you re remember and you look back to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, here's what the Lord says. As Jesse has called all the boys in, all of them, he says, nope, 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 nope. And here's what God himself says. He says, he says, I'm seeking a man. I'm looking for a man whose whole heart is about me. The Lord looketh on the what? On the heart and not on the what? Countenance. You know, you don't have to be good looking to love God. I'm saying said, Amen. 
Uh, You don't have to have a certain physical physique. You don't have to have a certain educational level. You don't have to be in a certain tax bracket. You don't have to live in a certain neighborhood. You don't have to wear certain clothes to love God and to walk with God. Tonight, as we look at David, I think we're going to find some wonderful things that will help us to be the kind of person that wants and should and needs to walk with God. Look at our first point with me. David, first of all, knew God. Now, you're in Psalms 23. It's the most familiar psalm, if you will, besides maybe Psalms 119. There's a couple of others, Psalms 51. But Psalms 23 is one that you'll often hear. And it's a lot of times read at a funeral or graveside. And, you know, it's a very familiar psalm, but it's a very powerful psalm. Because I want you to see the first few words. He says, the Lord is, what's the next word? The Lord is my shepherd. And as, uh, as they bring up that PowerPoint for you tonight, David knew God. He didn't just know about God, he knew God. David knew God personally. He had a personal relationship with God. Now, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have established a personal relationship with God. You're now his son or you're his daughter. You belong to him. You'll never change that relationship. David personally knew the Lord. He walked with the Lord. It sounds simple, but the first thing you got to do to know God is you got to know him personally. Again, there's a lot of people that are walking around who don't know him personally, but they think they do. You know what they think? They think, I go to church, so I know God. I got baptized, so I know God. My granddaddy was a deacon in the first such and such church. No. Know God personally. David knew God personally. He says, says, the Lord is my what? He's my shepherd. He was worshiping. He was fellowshipping. He was being directed by his creator. He had that confidence, that trust, that he was walking with God. He knew him. It was personal. Keep looking. Verse 1, I shall not want. How could this man say, I shall not want? Do you remember some of the things that happened in his life? Saul finds out he's going to be the next king. He's going to be anointed to be king. You know what Saul does? Saul's going to kill him. He throws a spear at him. He tries to shoot him with a bow and arrow. He's trying to kill this guy. He runs for his life. He hides. He's up in the mountains. He's, 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 skirting, uh, he's skirting Saul. He's staying away from him because the guy's trying to kill him. But he says, I shall not want. Why? Because the Lord is my what? He's my shepherd. Look at verse 2. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. David the shepherd boy is going to put himself underneath the shepherd. He's not just a shepherd, he's the shepherd. There's a great transition there. There's a lot of shepherds, but this is the shepherd. David himself was a shepherd, but he wasn't the shepherd. David knew that this was his shepherd, that he had led David. He had restored him. He had restored his soul. He had given him the provisions he needed. When he was troubled and needed assistance, his shepherd was there. When he needed guidance, his shepherd was there. 1 Samuel chapter 17, if you want to write a note under this point, 1 Samuel 17, verses 34 through 37, say this. And David said to Saul, thy servant keep his father's sheep. And there was a lion and a bear and a lamb took the lamb out of the flock, and I went after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I called him by the beard, and I smote him, and I slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the mouth of the bear, or out of the paw of the bear, and delivered me out of the hand of the Philistine, 
Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. David said, The Lord delivered me. David didn't say, My, my muscles, my intellect, my wisdom, my craftiness, the fact that I could use this, this, uh, this, uh, this sling and these rocks, and I was so proficient with it. He didn't say it was his own gifts, his own talents. He said, It was the Lord. Uh, you know, the, the Lord's blessed the daycare. He really has, and I'm so thankful he has. We're working hard. But you know what? The, 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 the glory belongs to the Lord. The right children, the right families, the right programs, all those things have come together. And, you know, praise his name. Bless him. He's the one that's done this. He's the provider. He's the shepherd. He's taking care of, just like he did with David. David recounts how Saul had previously, uh, David recounts in this situation that Saul wants him to wear his armor. And it's, he says, this armor's not tried, it's not true, it's not tested. I, it's too, you know, he's a little 16-year-old kid with this big king's armor on him. He says, I can't trust that. He says, but I can trust the Lord. You know why? Because I've got a personal relationship with him. It's personal. His God was personal to him. David's relationship with God was evident all around him. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 12 through 15, speaks of the fear that Saul had because he recognized this special relationship that David had with God. See, Saul had that relationship early on, but he did not follow God. He didn't listen. He wouldn't, he wouldn't underneath. He didn't submit to him. He began to do the things opposite as God had told him, and God took away that special special. Uh, relationship, if you will, that special, that special fellowship, I should say. And as you see this unfolding, God now has put his hand on him, on David. He's going to be the next king. If you remember Saul, do you remember Saul becoming who? Who does he become? Paul. You know where that happens? The road to Damascus. And as you Read about Paul. Paul says this about that situation. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, he says, Circumcised the eighth day the stock of, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of the Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching righteousness, which is of the law, blameless. You know what he says? He said, I was all stuck up on myself. I, I, I just had it all together. I was a good Christian in his situation, a good Jew. I, did every, I, I, I crossed every T. I dotted every I. I was on fire for keeping the law. In fact, you know the story. He's on the road to Damascus. Why is he on the road to Damascus? Because he's going to go persecute the church. He's got papers in hand to give him the permission to do that. And man... Christ appears to him. And you know what happens? What happens? Paul's life is dramatically changed. He goes from a guy who wants to persecute to the church and to a man that God's going to use to build the church. And you know what happens? His overwhelming desire becomes, I want to really know God. Instead of, I want to keep all the rules. I, I, I want to know all the rules because I want to keep them. And not only do I want to keep them, I want to enforce those rules on you. And if you're not keeping the rules, I'm coming after you. That was his heart. That was his mentality. But man, things change. He becomes this, this overwhelming personality who really wants to know God. Not just to know about him, he wants to know him. In fact, you know Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 goes on to say, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being made, being made conformable, conformable unto his death. He wanted to know God, just like David. David had this personal relationship with God. Now let me ask you, are, are, do you know the Lord personally? I mean, is it a personal relationship? I hope you do. Because you, you're never going to walk with God if you don't know him. Never. It won't happen. Well, secondly, B, David knew God intimately. 
Not only did he know him personally, he knew him intimately. You're still there at Psalms 23, I hope. Let's look at the next few verses. Verse 4 through 6. Verse 4 through 6, the end of the chapter. Yea, though I, I love this. Yea, though I walk, what's the next word? Yea, though I walk, here it is. Yea, though I walk, come on, help me. Through. I'm walking through, what does he say? The valley of the shadow of death. How many times should David have been killed and yet he walked through it? Who was that? Who was taking care of him? Go back to verse 1. Who's taking care of him? His shepherd. His shepherd. The shepherd. His personal shepherd. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will do what? I will fear no evil. Folks, we got a lot of evil in this world. I taught Pastor Hubbard's class this morning, and I mean, we talked a little bit about that. There's a lot of folks who are absolutely scared to death about what's going on in our country, in our world. And you know something? As Christians, we should not be fearful. Look what he says. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, what do they do? They comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love that. I will dwell. Our lesson talked about the fact that as believers, we have a happy ending to the story. We know the story ends with us going to be with the Lord forever. David puts that right on paper. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He had an intimate relationship. He knew God personally, but he also had an intimate relationship with him. David knew God. He came to know him. As you look at this verse, look at verse 4 again. He came to know him through some hard times. He came to know him intimately through the valley of the shadow of death. He came to know him as those people were after him, trying to kill him. He was constantly talking to him. God, what should I do? Where should I go? Who should I turn? Who should I trust? How should I deal? Who should I listen to? Constantly, because he's in trouble. Things are, are, are evil is around him. And he realizes he doesn't have to fear this evil. He, I love what he says about... Uh, he, he goes back to him being that shepherd, and he, he brings back those shepherd's tools, if you will. And he talks about this rod and this staff, and this rod was basically a club. And that club was used in the right hands. It was powerful. It had authority. But it was used to defend himself. It was also used to defend the sheep. And sometimes it was used to discipline. And you know something? I think David has to look back, and he has to go, you know, Sometimes God has, has used that rod on me. Sometimes David's got to think, you know, I got this personal, intimate relationship with God, and he's like, I've used that rod with the sheep that I watched to protect myself, to protect them, to discipline them, to get their attention. God's done that in my life, He's done that in Tommy East's life. If you've been a Christian very long, he's done that in your life. But he also reflects back to the staff. That staff was that long, if you will, that long stick with the crook on the end. That It was to draw that sheep close, closer, to nudge them sometimes away from danger. It was, uh, it was that comforting part of the shepherd as he'd walk along and he'd get that sheep and he'd just pull them over to him and he'd maybe pull the cuckaburrs out of their out of their hair, or he'd bring them over and show them where the water was and, or where the green grass was. And, and David remembers that sometimes God would just take that hook and he'd put around David and he'd just bring David a little closer to him and he'd let David know things were okay and things were good. And, and you know what? he let him know that he was right there, that he hadn't left David. Can you imagine some of the heart emotions that David had to be going through as he thinks about what happened, what, what he did with Bathsheba and her husband and all that situation? as he thinks about his children and how they turned out and how he hadn't been the father he should have been and how maybe he didn't love them like he should have and he, he didn't guide them and he, he sees how their lives, he, you know, there's got to be some pain, there's got to be some hurt. And yet he remembers God's taking that staff and he's just drawing him to him. He said, hey, David, come here. 
you're okay. I'm right here. Because he had that intimate relationship with him. Hey, Psalms chapter 56 verse 4 says, In God I will praise his word. In God I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. In Psalms 118 verse 6, David pens this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what man can do unto me. See, God had to use those rods in David's life more than once to bring him back, to discipline him so that God could comfort him through this time. David knew God intimately. He had put his trust in him. He had proved him. He had been, he had been faithful in these tests. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 12, Moses penned these through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit again. He pens these words as he's talking to the people of God. He says, I will walk among you and will be your God, and you shall be my people. And David had to reflect back on that as he thinks about what's going on in his own life. Now, what's going on in your life? I shared with the class this morning, my mom, uh, my dad's wife, Mom Nancy, just got news that she's got to have colon cancer surgery. She's got to have part of the colon removed. I've been on the phone with her, talking to her, and, and she said, Tommy, you know, I've got a peace right now. I'm trusting the Lord with it. You know, it's, it's, dur it's during those times, those, those troubling times, that we really sense the intimacy of God. He's there. You know well as I do, 2 Corinthians 7, 14, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and will hear their, heal their land. This nation needs to grab a hold of that verse. But before this nation does, you know who needs to grab a hold of it? Tommy East. Put your name there. You need to grab a hold of that verse. And understand that when we do that, we're inviting the revival for God. We're inviting him to have that intimate relationship with us. I'm going to give you a couple of chapters to write down. The time won't permit us to read all of these, but please take your pen and write down under this point, Psalms chapter 63, verses 1 through 6. Psalms 63, 1 through 6, talking about the fact that God is there. You know, David says in, in verse 1, he says, O oh God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. He, he goes on to talk and reflect as he's penning these words about what God is doing in his life and how God is there. Write Psalms 91. Psalms 91, again, verses 1 through 16. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And he goes on to describe what that looks like and how that happens. Because again, he has this intimate relationship with God. And oh, listen, oh, people that we might earn and yearn and say, dear God, give us that kind of relationship where we have that intimate walk with you and, and we sense personally that you're just working in our lives. It's so easy. It's so easy in the Christian life just to kind of do the Christian things. Are you listening? It's so easy just to do the Christian things. Okay, I'm going to go to church. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to have my devotions. And not just, and not sense that intimacy and that, and that closeness and that, and just him working in our lives because we've kind of just, we got in this Christian spiritual rut. Don't let that happen. Because you know what happens? If something comes along in life to, to kick you out of the rut. And normally it's some kind of trouble. You know when you find people really calling out to God? You know it. When they're in trouble. When, when something's going on with the family or themselves. Or, or you know, they, they now, oh man, okay God, i got to have you now. Don't wait till that happens. Do that now. Hey, secondly, let's look at the second thing in regards to David. David loved God. David loved God. Psalms, we're going to go to Psalms 116. We just left Psalms 23, but go to Psalms 116 with me. And as you turn there, God loves people. God loves you, God loves me, but God loves people. God wants to redeem people. God wants to see people come to know him. And as you think about that, understand this, that two people 
that are in love with one another is a, is a beautiful thing. Are you with me? You understand what I'm saying? Now, some people express love different than others. And I shared this a little bit in the class this morning. My dad and mom have been married all, 40 years now, I guess. And uh, dad's Thomas. I'm junior. Mom's name's Nancy. And sometimes when you're talking and they're on the phone, it, it sounds like they're fixing to knock each other out. Now, some of you are laughing because that's what y'all do, okay? It's that love language, but after that many years, they got it all figured out, and that's just how they talk to each other. And sometimes I have to say, hey, now, remember, your grandkids are watching this, and your great-grandkids are watching this. Y'all got to calm down a little bit. <laughs> but uh, look at Psalms 116. I'm going to get myself in trouble if I don't hush. Psalms 116. David loved God. He knew God intimately. He knew God personally. But he loved God. Psalms 116. Look at verse 1. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplication. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compassed me. And the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserved the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. Do you see what's going on with David? You know what he's doing? He's bragging on the Lord. He's worshiping the Lord. Keep looking with me, if you will. Verse 7. Return unto, the re unto thy rest, O my soul. For the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. God always, now listen now, God always was there for David, even when David messed up. And you know something? He's always there for you, and he's always there for me when we mess up. Say, Tommy, you don't know what I've done. And you know something? You're right. I don't know what you've done, and you don't know what I've done. You might say, Tommy, you don't know what I'm doing right now. And you're right. I don't. But I know this. When you come back to God, if you're his child, he's always there for you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you've hurt or what you've said, what's come out of your mouth. He is always there for you. And you know, what, you know how we know that? Because we see this happen over and over again in David's life. God was always there for him. David had sometimes to suffer some hard consequences. But you know, God never left him. David, in this particular chapter, verses 1 through 9, he's expounding on the fact that he loves God. And he loves God... So much because of this. He loves him because he's so grateful to what he's done. Sometimes I think we as God's children, we need to just stop and take a day and just say, okay, let me just think about everything God's done for me, for my family, for our church. Again, I, I, I'm not just talking. God's done some amazing things at our daycare that I, I, I don't have the liberty to share with you. But I'm talking amazing things. I mean, we went through COVID, we got down to 36 children. We didn't have to fire one staff person. We did give some folks furloughs, but they got paid through that process. We, at, when it hit, we were at 172 children, and we got down to 36. Today, we're back about 130. And by the way, if you need a good job, if you're looking for a way to minister to children, come see me. You know... I, how, people say, well, how did that happen? I, I, I just asked God. God did it. Now, we, again, I don't want to take anything away from our staff. Uh, Miss Andrea in our office, Miss Tina, our, all of our staff who work with the children. Greg, you know, those guys worked hard. They, you know, some of them were furloughed. They came back. Some of them decided to go ahead and retire. But, man, God has just blessed us through this whole process. And I just have to, I have to brag on him. 
And I have to say, thank you, God. And that's exactly what David's doing. And sometimes in our life, we need to just say, God, I want to have a per I want to have a I want to have a personal relationship. I want it to be intimate. And sometimes we got to stop and say, I just need to tell you I love you. Don't you love him? David talks about he loves him because of all the things that he's done for him. He's got that heart of gratitude. Hey, 1 Chronicles 16, write that chapter down. 1 Chronicles 16. David is under the leadership, of course, of the Holy Spirit, but he's reminding the children of Israel of the things they should be grateful to God for. Let me list a few of them with you. You should be grateful for God because of all of his wondrous works, according to 16.9. You should be grateful to God because of his holy name, 1610. You should be grateful to God because of his strength, 1611. You should be grateful to God for his judgment, 1612 and 14. You should be grateful to God for his covenant, 1615 and 19. You should be grateful to God for his goodness and his mercy, 1634. And he's leading these people to be the kind of people they should be in being thankful to God and, be, and being grateful, expressing their love to God. Oh, we as a church, if we would just get a hold of loving God. When people walked in here, if they could just sense that spirit, this church loves God. It'll change Bible Baptist Church. And you know what? It'll change Bible Baptist Church as it leaves this door. Years ago, we went, myself and Dr. Hodges and several staff guys, we went to First Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida, because that church was just on fire, and they were reaching thousands of people. And we met with one of the associate guys named Doug Pig, never forget him. And Dr. Hodges and I and the guys that were with us, we were all sitting there, and, you know, Dr. Hodges, he's a mover shaker, so he says, okay, Doug, tell me the secret. How in the world can y'all do all this? And Doug looked at Dr. Hodges and he said, well, the pastor tells us just to love Jesus. And Dr. Hodges said, yeah, I know that, I know that, but, but, no, no, but tell me, is it, is it a program, is it this, is it that? He said, and Doug looked at him just as serious as a heart attack. He said, the pastor tells us to love Jesus. Four times he said the same thing. And you know what I got in my head? If you teach people to love Jesus, they're going to live right, they're going to talk right, they're going to act right, they're going to care about other people because you know what? Jesus did all those things. So if you love Jesus, you're going to look and live and act and talk like Jesus. Whew. That was very eye-opening to me. Hey, write down Psalms 100, 100 verses 1 through 5. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. And he goes on and he talks about... This gratitude, this attitude of being grateful to God. They did a study of 50 different people over 100 years old. They studied their common practices, their lifestyles, their exercise, their diets, their habits. And they, they went through all the, their eating. They went through uh, exercise. What, what, what got them to 100? They were looking for a common thread that was weaving through their lives that helped them to get to 100. They found two things. Two things. So let me share them with you. Number one was they had a practice of gratefulness. Nine out of ten, a practice of gratefulness. You want to live a long time? I, I would like to, if the Lord's willing. Be grateful. The second thing they found is that the second habit they found was a habit of forgiveness. Again, 9 out of 10 of the studies showed they didn't hold grudges, they refused to hang on to any negative thinking, they let things go, and they moved on. Gratitude and forgiveness. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? It sounds like something that God told us to do, didn't he? Absolutely. David learned that. He loved God. Love is not a feeling. It's not a feeling. It's, it's, it's expressed in what you do. I love Vicki. I do have ooshy-gooshy feelings for her, okay? I just want you to know. But I, I, I don't just go, oh, I got ooshy-gooshy feelings for you because I love you. I love her because I provide and I take care and, and I put gas in her car. 
She doesn't like to do it. It's okay. I can do it. You know what she does? I can't tell you. Never mind. I can't tell you what she does for me, but she, ah, never mind. She's here. I'll tell you later. Come see me. Let's look at the second, po- the second point, okay? Our PowerPoint's not working, I don't guess. It's not up there. Sorry about that. Hey, David loved God. Not only did he love him gratefully, but he loved him devotedly, devotedly. You're there at Psalms 116, aren't you? Yes? Look at verse 12. What shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits toward me? He was devoted to God. Look at verse 13. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Publicly, he's, he's making a public statement that he's surrendering to God. He's making a public statement that God has taken care of him. Can you ever repay God for what he's done for you? Yes or no? Absolutely not. But you know what you can do? You can make a choice to live for him. You can make a choice to let your light shine for him. You can't ever repay him for salvation. But you can say, God, because I love you, I want to live for you. God, because I love you, I want people to see you and me. It's not, well, God, you know I did all this for you, so now you have to love me. God already loves you. Or God, I did all this stuff for, for you, so now you have to let me in heaven. No. Mm-mm. God, I, I, I do this for you because I love you. I, I sing in the choir, God. Because I love you. I play an instrument, God, because I love you. I work in the parking lot, God, because I love you. I teach the children or the teens or or adult class, God, because I love you. David, over and over again, was devoted. He showed it. He testified publicly. Publicly, he talked about his goodness. He praised him. He talked about his dedication to God. He offered the same comfort to others that they should be involved in the same things. A bodybuilder was interviewed by a television host on a program, and he uh, came on, and he's a bodybuilder, and he's flexing. He's, well, I better not do it. I might, bust, I might bust this jacket, so I better be careful. Don't laugh. Who's laughing? But the bodybuilder's doing the poses, and so the, the host finally says, well, that, man, that's wonderful, and, and uh, it's very impressive. I'm sure you're very strong, and so what do you use all this for? And the bodybuilder didn't answer his question. He just did another pose. Throughout his calf muscle. Man, that, that, that's very impressive. So what do you use all those muscles for? Never did answer him. By the third time, he finally said, well, it's, it's for admiration. Sometimes I think Christians serve the Lord for that same reason. Just for admiration. Don't do that. Don't be like that. David was definitely not like that. He was set to serve God. Let's look at the last point. David agreed with God. Now we're going to Psalms 119. Now guess what? We're not going to read that whole psalm. Aren't you glad? That psalm has the most verses in it. It's a chapter in the Bible. But in Psalms 119, we find that David agreed with God. Do you understand that walk with God is only found two times in the Bible? It's found in Genesis 5, 22 and 24. Enoch walked with God. Verse 24, again, Enoch walked with God. And it's also found in Genesis 6, 9. There was a generation of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. It's never said, actually, that David walked with God. But I, but I bring that up to, to tell you this. Amos chapter 3, verse 3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? I'm going to tell you that David walked with God because he was agreed. He was agreeing with God. He, he agreed with whatever God, whatever the direction God wanted to go, that's, where, that's the way he wanted to go. Whatever God didn't want to do, he didn't want to do that. To walk together means that you're going the same direction and you're going at the same pace. You're going the same direction and you're going the same pace. Why are some people so foolish to argue with God? They are. Uh, I got to go to uh, Griffin, Georgia's Saturday and, and watch my three, gun, my three grandsons play baseball. They all three had a game. 
Well, before the game, they had pictures, so we had to be there at like 8.50 or 8.45, something like that, because they all had to take pictures. So it's a massive complex, probably about seven baseball diamonds all over everywhere, football, four or five football fields, soccer fields. Well, on the very far right over here of this complex is where they're taking pictures. And so we're, we're kind of standing over here, messing around with the kids, having a good time. And all of a sudden, I hear these guys, blah, 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 with each other. And so one of the grandparents of one of the kids on the team told the coach, well, I'll just meet you afterwards in the parking lot. Foolishness. You know what happened? Here's a person that let anger get the best of them. I mean, you got three and four and five year old kids all the way up to 14 year old kids. And you're going to challenge the coach after the game in the parking lot? Well, it needs to say, all of a sudden the sheriff showed up. And that guy left. That was awesome. Now, what does that have to do with this point in the lesson? I don't know, but it sounds really good. No. That, that man did not agree with what was going on. But instead of handling it the right way, he handled it the wrong way. When you don't agree with God, you're in trouble. David agreed with God. He was submissive to God. Psalms chapter 119, verse 9 through 12. You there? Psalms 19, verses 9 through 12. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed thereunto according to thy word? With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. David was submissive to God, to his word. He followed it. He trusted it. He leaned into it. David was a great leader, but he still was submissive to God. He didn't try to take things into his own hands when he was right with the Lord. He looked to the Lord to direct him. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 says, Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for the unprofitable for that is unprofitable to you. You know, when a Christian friend comes up to you and, and talks to you about something, you, 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 you might need to listen. You might just need to listen instead of arguing and justifying what you're doing. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. David agreed, not only submissively, but he, 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 he uh, agreed with God consistently. Look at verse 13 again, chapter 19. With my lips have I declared all thy judgments with my mouth. Verse 14. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as all the riches. I will mediate in thy precepts. Excuse me. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. Verse 16. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. He was consistent. Remember what Malachi 3, 6 says? For I am the Lord, I change not. Proverbs 9, 119, 89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. He's not going to change. David agreed with God submissively and consistently. May I say this, when you, when you come to a problem, maybe a fork in the road in your life, and you're wondering what you should do, don't disagree with God. Agree with Him. Find out what the Word of God says. Listen to the Word of God. Don't run from it. Run to it. I hope tonight that maybe these few things that we've shared will be a help to you. I want you to remember again, David... He knew God, he loved God, he agreed with God. I hope that we, as God's people, will strive to do the same things. That we'll make it part of our heart to know him more, to love him better, and to submit to him consistently. Because when you do that, 
the peace of God is going to rule your heart. Amen. Join with me as we close the service now in prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed, if you will, please. And we're going to have just a simple invitation for just a moment. And then Mike Finley is going to come and close our service, Pastor Finley. But I hope and pray that God will use this in your life. David is a, he's a man of like passions. He, he's just a real person. He's, he's the kind of guy that we see that relates to us because though he had a heart for God, he did mess up at times, and yet God was still there, still loving, still forgiving, still had purpose for him and reason for him to exist and things for him to do. He had to get things right with the Lord many times. Maybe tonight there's something, and you know there's something between you and God, and you need to get it right. Maybe you need to come this morning or this evening and just say, Lord, I want to be that kind of person that, that I know you more, that I love you better. And Father, I want to be submitted to you always. Lord, I ask that you bless this time of invitation. Lord, if people need to respond, God help them to do so. If there are people watching online tonight and you're speaking to them, Lord, may they, in just the quietness of that spot, may they just talk to you and allow you to talk to them. We ask your blessings on this invitation, and we ask it in Christ's name. If you would stand with us, if the Lord's spoken to your heart and you need to respond, now's the time to do that. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. Pastor Tommy for that great message and I hope that you enjoyed that.